Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for all of those that returned to this third and final lecture online and also here at the OS. Um, so this is lecture number three. And uh, the title is Applications um, to Geometry. So let me recall you what we have done so far. So we have been working always with the perfect base field of characteristic uh, P, P greater or equal than zero. And in the first lecture, uh, we saw this theorem saying that if you have a, a smooth proper uh, K scheme, then um, you can look at the conjectures uh, the celebrated conjectures for X, this non-commutative counterparts for the associated DG category of perfect complexes. We saw that there is no difference between these two, and also that we can uh, more generally consider not solely the DG category, but also the corresponding non-commutative child motive, uh, even with rational coefficients. And this for any C, the conjecture, uh, the one of Grotendieck, Voivodsky, Valinson, Vale, and all these variants of the Tate conjecture. Okay, so this is uh, what we have seen so far in today. So what's the idea today? So to, today what we will explore is the following. So we want uh, to find, we can look at this uh, non-commutative motives even with rational coefficients. So given any two x and y smooth proper algebraic varieties, you can look at the corresponding non-commutative Chow motives even with rational coefficients. And uh, also I can look at the conjectures for x and the conjectures for y. And I would like to find today a relation between these two. I want to find a relation uh, in such a way that that relation will imply uh, an equivalence between these conjectures. So that's the, the main idea for today. So what, uh, what can we do? Uh, first of all, uh, first case, the very first case where we can find this relation is when we have a drive invariant. Um, so suppose that the categories of perfect complexes on X and on Y, they are even, they are equivalent, equivalent via a fourier mukai equivalence. Then in that case, well, that implies that the corresponding motives uh, of X and Y are equivalent, are isomorphic. And of course, if you just use the, the above string of equivalence, that's going to imply that the conjectures of X and of Y do not change. So the conjectures x and y for x and y do not change if x and y are derived equivalent. Okay. Let me make some remarks about this. So first of all, um, it is known that uh, if the canonical or anti-canonical um, uh, bundles of x and y are ample, then uh, it's a very interesting result of Bondal and Orlov that in that case the varieties themselves are isomorphic. Okay, so it's a very strong restriction that we have here under this assumption, but of course uh, there are cases uh, of non-isomorphic algebraic varieties, for example, an abelian variety and its dual abelian variety. Um, so, 
um, for which um, for which the corresponding uh, derived categories of x and y are equivalent. And this was this pioneering work of Mukai. Okay? So our formalism that we, our results that we explain automatically imply drive the invariance of these classical conjectures. But, uh, so this is a, a very strong relation and um, there are many other cases we, where we actually have a relation between these non-commutative motives. And one machinery to establish these relations is called homological um, uh, projective duality. Um, so we usually write HPD. And this is a, a theory that was developed by Kuznetsov. So let me explain how does this work. So the idea is the following. So you have an algebraic variety equipped with a map towards a projective space. Uh, you can think as being a, a, an inclusion, but you don't, it doesn't need to be an inclusion. Then you can look at the associated line bundle where you pull back along this F, the line bundle on this projective space. And then what you want to do is to study hyperplane sections of X. So you have hyperplane sections of X. And if you want to study them, you can study them uh, all together simultaneously. So you can first look at the uh, incidence quadric. So inside of the projective space cross the dual. Okay, so you can look at this incidence variety. And then you can look at the universal hyperplane section. Uh, and this uh, is simply the fiber product of X with uh, this incidence quadric over the projective space. And this sits inside X cross the dual projective space. Okay. Uh, so this carries information about all possible hyperplane sections of X. If you fix here a uh, uh, point, you are thinking about an hyperplane. And so when you look at the corresponding fiber over the projection over PV, that corresponds to the hyperplane section. And so our goal would be to understand this, this category of H, a category of all hyperplane sections. And the result is that suppose that we understand the category of X itself. So suppose that the category of X uh, has a very specific form. Uh, it is what is called a left sheds decomposition. Suppose that it admits a left sheds decomposition. So that means simply that you have a sequence of uh, triangulated categories inside in such a way that when you twist them using this line bundle, so here you have A0 and then you twist one with this line bundle, etc., until AI twisted I times, then you get a semi-orthogonal decomposition, a classical semi-orthogonal decomposition of your variety. Suppose that you are in such a setting, then you can say something about this um, drive category. So inside of it, what do you have? Well, uh, so let me get some extra room here. So what you have uh, here is that all these, uh, all these uh, blocks will also exist here. So you have this, and then, of course, you need to uh, do the a box product with the perfects on the dual projective space. Okay, and then uh, it turns out that there is something orthogonal that is still missing, and he, so here you have a, an extra category that appears, and this category is called the HP dual category of X. OK, 
Okay, so what I've done so far is something very formal. You start with a scheme, you quickly a map towards a projective space. And suppose that this scheme has a semi-orthogonal decomposition of this very specific shape, like a left shed's decomposition. For example, that's what happens with the projective space. Uh, you are, for example, you have O, O1 twisted by one, O2 twisted by two, etc. Then you can say something about this category of the universal upper plane section. It has all these pieces in its interior, box times this part, and then something mysterious, something orthogonal that appears here. Okay? And now what's interesting about this theory is when this very abstract category, this HP dual category, it's in fact geometric. Sometimes it turns out that this category it's geometric, what do I mean by that? So I mean that sometimes this category here, it's actually uh, equivalent to perfect complexes on a, a different algebraic variety. And sometimes it's not actually a, a just an algebraic variety, but it's a twisted by a certain sheaf of algebras. So not very far from being an algebraic variety. Okay, and in both cases we call this Y, uh, we call it the HP uh, dual variety, dual variety of X, and in particular it comes equipped with a map towards the dual projective space. Okay, and suppose that we are in such a setting, then what you can do is that if you have a subspace of the dual of V, well, then you can consider its orthogonal, which is just the kernel of this induced map. And then here you can do two things. First of all, you can do uh, the linear section with respect to this subspace. So you just take your original X and do the fiber product over the projective space with P, V, or, or orthogonal. Or you can do the linear section of Y, so where you do the fiber product over the dual projective space with P of V. E. Okay, and now the, the theorem, uh, which I call the HPD invariant, says the following. Um, so the what was upstairs was the derived invariance of the conjectures. This is the HPD invariance of the conjectures, says the following. Suppose that these linear sections uh, are in fact smooth. Suppose that, the, that they have the, uh, the expected dimensions in the sense that the co-dimension of this linear section is equal to the dimension of L and also that the co-dimension of this linear section is equal uh, to the dimension of L perpendicular. And also let's assume that our conjecture, the non-commutative version, is true on this largest piece, on this A0. Sorry. So, yeah. When the co-dimension is this, what is the co who, on which space is co-dimension of? Yes, because you see this thing will be uh, is defined in this sense, so it, it, you, you will have uh, uh, x, in, you can think about x uh, inside the projective space, for example, and then you're taking a, a uh, okay, hyperplane section. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, and you assume that this conjecture for the largest piece holds. So some remarks about these assumptions. So first of all, this, the first two assumptions, they hold for a, a generic choice of your L, Okay, so they are quite mild. And the, the last assumption, they, it holds, in fact, in all the cases, in all the examples uh, so far, because in all the examples, these categories here that appear in the left shed's decomposition are quite simple. In particular, uh, they often admit uh, full exceptional collections. So uh, assuming this, it turns out that the conjecture for this uh, linear section and the conjecture for this linear section they are equivalent. So this is the content of the theorem. 
simply saying that, okay, under these assumptions, the conjectures do, do not vary, okay? So what is the idea here? So just a, a brief idea of the proof, what's behind of this, is that when you look at the non-commutative motive of this uh, linear section uh, and the non-commutative motive of this linear section, um, they encode, so there is a, a common piece inside of them coming from this uh, uh, mysterious C. So you have a, a certain category here, okay, which is common in both of them. And then you have extra things, extra factors. But these extra factors here, they all, uh, um, the conjecture, this conjecture holds for all of these pieces. Because these pieces are the pieces that are coming from this one. They are in fact uh, um, direct summons of this one. And since the conjecture holds here, it will hold for direct summons. These pieces are not necessarily the same. But, uh, well, this tells you that, well, the conjectures hold here, hold here. So, in fact, the non-commutative conjecture for this linear section is just the non-commutative conjecture for this non-commutative gadget. The non-commutative conjecture for this linear section is just the non-commutative conjecture for this. So, you get an equivalence between the non-commutative conjectures of these two. And then you use the fact that the non-commutative or classical conjectures are equivalent. So, somehow, you want to relate two geometric things, XL and YL, both of them live in the world of geometry, and what you do is a zigzag. You go towards this mysterious non-commutative thing, you go there, and then come back. You pass from X to L, from L to Y, via a zigzag, via something truly non-commutative. Okay, so that's the idea behind. Um, so now uh, there are a lot of uh, HPD dualities in the literature. So there are a lot of HPD dualities in the literature. Let me just give you an idea of two of them. Uh, so we have uh, examples of HPD dualities. This, for example, the Veronese Clifford duality, uh, the Grassmannian Paffian. Um, uh, uh, duality, the spinner duality, the determinantal duality, and many others. So I propose to look at uh, two examples, to look at this one, where in that case the HP2 variety will be of the first form, so we twist it by a certain sheaf of algebras, and then the second case where the HPD dual will be actually geometric given by just an ordinary algebraic variety. So let's uh, let's look at the Veronese uh, Clifford uh, duality. So HPD duality. So this is built from work of Kapranov and Kuznetsov. So what is the idea here? You start with a um, vector space of dimension D. And you look at V, the sin 2 of V, of W, sorry. So this is your V of the theory. And then your algebraic variety is very simple. It's just a projective space on W. But then uh, the map here, it's a non-trivial map going to P of V, in other words, to P of sin 2. And the map, it, it sends uh, W, W tensor W, in other words, it's the Veronese embedding. Okay, so this is my algebraic variety, this is my projective space, and this is my map. Okay, so in this case, 
if you look at the universal hyperplane section, so and you project to the dual projective space of V, in other words, you project here, it turns out that what is this is in fact a quadric vibration because here, so here let's, let's uh, simplify and work not in characteristic two, okay? So what you have here, uh, you have a quadratic form and above it, the fiber is precisely the associated quadric. Okay, so in fact, this thing uh, in this particular case is a quadric vibration. And if it's a quadric vibration, I can build out of it a sheaf of algebras. Okay, uh, and which I denote like this. So let me explain what it is. So, so let's make a parenthesis here. So suppose just that you just have a quadratic form on a vector space to, towards your base field, okay? Suppose that you have a quadratic form. Then uh, what can you do? Uh, if you have a quadratic form, you can look at uh, the tensor algebra of V, and then you could mod out by V tensor V, if you do this, you just have the exterior algebra, but then what you can do is that you can quantize this by deforming it by this quadratic form and get this new algebra, which is called the Clifford algebra of your quadratic form. But you see that the way uh, these relations are set up, it's not graded, but it is Z2 graded. So you have an even and odd part, so you can look just at to the even part. So you can do this for any quadratic form. So here you have one of those on the base, and then you can vary that, and actually you can get a shift on this base. So you actually have a shift of algebras, okay, by doing this procedure over a base. You should be non-degenerate, no? Uh, no, it can be degenerate. Okay. Oh, okay, it can be zero. So that is precisely uh, So let me just say that uh, a notation let's denote by Z um, just uh, the singular locus, so inside here, the singular locus of uh, the singular locus of your quadric vibration. Okay, so above those points, you actually have uh, singular quadrics. And now it turns out the key point is that the HP dual variety. In this story, HP dual variety uh, of X is the following, it's just uh, the, this dual projective space, okay, but equipped with this sheaf of algebras. Okay, so we are in that setting where the HP dual variety is not just an algebraic variety, but it is perturbed by a sheaf of algebras, okay. Uh, and then uh, what can we do? We can, uh, if we have uh, a subspace on my uh, dual, um, then I can do, as before, I can take linear sections here or linear sections on the HP dual. And if I do sections here, that corresponds to do the intersection of the quadrics, the quadrics in my projective space, which are parameterized by L. Okay, so intersect as many quadrics as the dimension of your space L. And on the other side, what you do is just that you do a restriction. So you restrict here this shift to the P of L. Okay. So we know that to, to solve the conjecture for intersection of quadrics is to solve the non-commutative conjecture for this gadget. 
So let's understand this gadget a little bit better. So it turns out that uh, this category um, uh, with this shift of, of algebra, uh, it's e e uh, equivalent to a category perfect complexes on the on a certain double covering of the projective space and this with a, an Azumai algebra. So what's happening here is that you have the, the projective space and you have uh, this, this uh, double cover, twofold cover of this, uh, which is defined. So what do you do? You take the spec over PL and then you take the center of your uh, even Clifford algebra. Okay, so this is what you get, and you get the twofold cover which is ramified uh, on this uh, singular locus. And uh, on the and that is what's happening when the when D um, is even. Okay, D upstairs is even, so D it's actually equal to the dimension of the, the quadric that you are considering, the quadrics that you are considering. In the, in the odd case, in the odd case, this category is equivalent. Uh, now what you have, it's a root stack, as we saw yesterday, it now equipped with a certain sheaf of algebras, which is also an Azumaya uh, sheaf of algebras, and this uh, root stack that you have above your PL, uh, it's in fact uh, this two root stack where what you do is you get the singular locus intersect with PL over the PL. So it's the root stack that we saw yesterday. And so as a corollary, so as a corollary, what do we get? We get the following that the conjecture for intersecting quadrics that's equivalent, well, we know that it's the conjecture for I of L, and so this turns out to be just the classical conjecture for this uh, twofold cover of the projective space, this in the even case. And here it becomes the conjecture uh, becomes the non commutative conjecture for this uh, perfect complexes on this uh, root stack equipped with this uh, shift of Azumai algebra. Okay. So, um, so what does that imply? That implies that, uh, for example, when D is even, in other words, when you are intersecting even dimensional uh, quadrics, so this conjecture uh, about intersection of quadrics holds uh, when, for example, when you are intersecting uh, three or less quadrics for the conjecture of Grotendieck and Voivodsky, when you are intersecting two quadrics for the, the other conjectures of Bailington and Tate, and of course, uh, for any dimension for the veil conjecture. So of course, you already knew that veil conjecture is true, but here you give you like an alternative way to see it. And also you get, for example, when D is odd, so when you are intersecting odd dimensional uh, quadrics, that the conjecture for this intersection holds uh, when, for example, when the dimension, when you are intersecting two quadrics, and moreover, um, for example, when you are working over a finite field or, uh, or over an algebraically closed field, because in that case, the Brouwer group of curves disappears. So in that case, what you get is that this, this sheaf of Azumai algebras goes away. You just get a root stack, and then root stacks we saw yesterday how to manage them. Okay, so this is just an example. Uh, it gives you an alternative way to prove these conjectures 
for intersection of quadrics in an alternative way to the one that was done by Miles Reed in his thesis, which was geometric. Well, Why in the, in the even D case you don't need to consider to, to worry about the Azumai algebra? Because we saw yesterday how to attack the Azumai algebra. When you have an Azumai algebra, the motives with Q coefficients are the same with or without an Azumai algebra. I see. But when you are, have an Azumai algebra over a root stack, that is not the case. Ah, I see. But over an ordinary scheme, there's no difference. If, but over a stack, there is a difference. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so now I propose that to, to look to have the other example of the determinant of varieties. So that's the example where the HP dual variety will be actually a variety. So a determinant of um, HPD. So this was established by uh, Bernard Dara, uh, Menzi and Tanzi. Um, so what's, how does it work here? So you have uh, two uh, vector spaces, W1 and W2, of dimensions M and N. Let's assume for simplicity that M is less or equal than N. And then what is our V? Our V is this tensor product of the two. And then I choose uh, an integer r between 0 and m. And out of this, I can look at the, the variety r m n inside the projective space, consisting, it's the determinant of variety of m by n matrices. OK, with, with rank whose rank is less or equal than R. So uh, let me maybe give you a down-to-earth description. What do you do? You look at this matrix of uh, indeterminacies. So you have a, a matrix like this. Uh, going to xm1, xmn. And then what you impose here, the relations that you impose, is that the r plus one, uh, r plus one minors, are actually equal to zero. So you have all these variables, and you have these relations, and that's going to give you a projective variety. Okay. For example, give you an example. So are those varieties that are defined by equations that are coming from minors. So, uh, for example, if you have, if you have, uh, if you fix the rank to be one, then these are nothing but the, the Sager varieties. And for example, one, two, two, this is just, you look at those uh, quadruples uh, such that this relation holds, this determinant relation holds. And that's uh, uh, a, a surface in P3. Okay? And in the same way that you can do this determine, define this determinant of variety, you can define it, it's dual. So you, you have something inside the dual projective space. Okay, so it's the determinant of variety um, of M by N matrices but now uh, with co-rank uh, greater or equal than R. And it turns out that these things are in fact uh, singular, so we cannot work with them, but they admit the uh, very canonical uh, resolutions of singularities called Springer resolution of singularities. 
So we have this one admits a, a resolution of singularities. And uh, the key fact is that uh, x and y are uh, HP duo to each other. Okay, so that implies that if I, if I, whenever I have a subspace in the dual of V, I can take uh, one linear section or another linear section. Okay, and now what's uh, so interesting here, you see the following. So we get this corollary um, consisting of two parts. So first part, so let's suppose that, uh, so we see that in this definition, we have four parameters. We have M and N, the size of the matrix, then R, the rank, and we also have the possibility of choosing my L, and so we have the dimension of L. So we have four parameters. And now let's assume that we have the following relation between these parameters. So that this uh, is, so this number that it's here, it's actually the dimension of this linear section. And the dimension, and similarly, this number here uh, are m plus n minus r minus 1 minus dimension of L. Uh, this is the dimension of the other linear section. And so let's suppose that uh, they have dimensions less or equal than 1. Then in that case, what does that imply? That whenever the parameters satisfy this inequality, well, you get for free that the conjecture for the other linear section holds. Okay? And so let's explore this. So let's explore, for example, the first implication. So the first implication, let's explore it, for example, in the case of Sager varieties. Uh, that means that the R is equal to 1. Well, when R is, act so in the case of Sager varieties, they are already smooth, so we don't need the resolution, so we are re really taking linear sections. Um, so in that case, uh, that number becomes M minus N minus 2 plus the dimension of L less or equal than 1, then I know that the dimension of XL in that case is equal to M plus N minus 2 minus the dimension of L. So what the, what's interesting here is the following. So um, suppose that I enlarge, so I'm in this case, and suppose that I enlarge the size of my matrix in the same way, so I replace M by M plus I, and n by n plus i, and I keep the dimension of L fixed. So if I do this, this number does not change, okay? But in contrast here, this augments by 2i. So you see that uh, here you have infinite, uh, infinite number of, uh, an infinite family of algebraic varieties, all of them satisfying the conjectures, and they are of arbitrary high dimension, simply because the dimension of this is fixed, and the dimension of this is changing, and the conjecture for this one is true. Is it, is it geometric that you are taking uh, ample line bundles, tensor for twisting by ample line bundles with high enough power? Is it, does it mean that? Uh, because this 2i comes in this dimension of XL, because maybe I'm not very precise, but is it geometric in this you have enough embedding because you are working with varieties and you're embedding embedded this variety into some big projective space it's not actually that we can we can discuss after it's, it's not uh, uh, and the uh, other example uh, for example of square matrix um, so in that case that means that uh, the dimensions m and n are the same in that case the uh, this uh, you have this 
but in this case the dimension of the dual uh, variety is 2rm uh, minus r square minus 1 minus dimension of l. So again you see that if you change, so here m is not even appears, so when you in increase the dimension of your, this number does not change, but this increases by 2rm. So again, you see another family of algebraic varieties, all of them satisfying the conjectures, and they are of arbitrary I dimension. And uh, interestingly, these cases, uh, it's not known to the experts how to prove the conjectures for these cases using just algebraic geometry, just classical algebraic geometry. Another interesting remark is that, uh, for example, in what regards the Vell conjectures, well, they are known, of course, thanks to the link, but you see here that uh, in the case of curves, so this is the dimension of uh, YL, so I'm assuming that it's a curve. So but for curves, the Vell conjecture was originally proved by Vail using the elementary intersection theory of divisors on surface. So here you are bootstrapping the, this result of Vail to higher dimensions without using the link, for example. So it gives you an alternative proof of the Vell conjectures that doesn't use the links techniques. And of course, these results are much more refined. This number one is here because we know that all the conjectures that I'm talking about, they are true for curves. But if you want to be more specific, for example, if you want Voivodsky conjecture, then you could put a two here, etc. So, so this is the previous board. For curves, you have to show some well positivity in, in the intersection number. You have to show that, that this is positive. Inside. Yeah, that's the. the so how, I miss this. How, how does this for the curves in this well positivity here? No, this is exactly the point. Is that the way that I prove it is like a, the drawing that I mentioned to you is that the conjecture becomes from a curve and this higher dimensional variety. Mm -hmm. The conjecture is equivalent to this ah, okay. non commutative gadget. Mm -hmm. And then you come back. So you do this zigzag, this step where you use the non commutative world. So it's, it's a not geometric proof, and that's the interest that you can go to higher dimensions. Okay, so in the remaining of my time, so there are many other examples, many other HPD dualities, many other cases where you have proven the conjecture in this perspective for new um, varieties. But uh, just to finish this lecture and the course, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the Riemann hypothesis. So let me recall you that if you have a smooth um, a proper uh, scheme over a finite field uh, of dimension D, Okay, then we defined in the first lecture its Hasseveil zeta function as the product over all closed points of 1 uh, over 1 minus q degree of x minus s. So this is actually the cardinality of the residue field at that point. And this converges when the real part of s is greater than d. And then we, uh, we, 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 <coughs> uh, we saw that uh, by combining the, veil, uh, the Link's work on the Veil conjecture with the work of Bertolou in crystalline cohomology, you have this cohomological interpretation of the uh, Asseveil zeta function using the, the Frobenius and acting on the crystalline cohomology. So we wrote it like this, omega plus one. So in what follows, I will, these pieces here, so this piece here, uh, I will denote it by the Asseveil zeta function of x of weight uh, omega. Okay, this is, will be my notation. Gonzalo, it's hard to see what you have written on the bottom. Ah, okay. uh, this, uh, red chart. So, so the, it is the Asseveil zeta function of weight omega. Thank okay, you. just this piece. So it, the ordinary one, it's an alternating product of Asseveil zeta functions with different weights. 
Uh, so this is over a finite field, and that's what we saw last time. So now we go to a number field. So to simplify, let's just go to Q. So we can go to, to Q. So take uh, now uh, X, a smooth and proper uh, Q scheme, okay, of dimension D. Um, then we know that uh, there exists a smooth uh, model, a smooth proper uh, model um, over the so, so away from a finite number of bad primes and uh, so let's assume that we have good reduction in other words let's assume uh, that there exists a smooth uh, proper model um, so xi over uh, each one of these uh, bad prime, so localized at pi, and this for i between 1 and n. And if this is the case, if we have good reduction, we can do the following. So if you choose an integer, a weight between 0 and twice the dimension, uh, what you can do is do the L function of this weight of x by definition. You just do the product over all primes different from the bad ones. And here uh, you do the Aceveil zeta function of this weight on the fiber. So this stands for the fiber of this model of this model at uh, at p. So that will give you an algebraic variety over a finite field. And then you multiply by the remaining bad primes. Um, so and here you do. By this, I mean the fiber of this model, of this model at the prime pi. Okay. And then uh, it turns out it's a it's a result, a theorem of Sayer, that in fact this uh, function uh, actually converges. Uh, on this half plane where the real part of S is greater than omega 2 plus 1 and it's moreover z different from 0 in this region. So you have uh, the following picture. So over C you have uh, omega 2 plus 1, uh, omega over 2, and here in the middle you have this one. Okay, so you know that uh, in this region, uh, so you know that in this region, it converges and it's not zero. Okay. And now, uh, uh, what regards this this L functions? So there are. They can be associated with these uh, conjectures. So the first one is a conjecture uh, M of X uh, that says the following. So whenever you have a weight between zero and twice the dimension, uh, first of all, this function admits uh, needs a, a, a unique a meromorphic uh, um, continuation to C. The entire uh, complex plane. And moreover, uh, um, this, this extension has no poles, has no poles um, in the critical stripe, so consisting uh, 
on the on the complex numbers whose real part sits between here. So here you, you have this critical stripe. Here in this interior, uh, the conjecture is that there are no poles. So not only you can extend it to a meromorphic function, but there are no poles here, this critical stripe. And then uh, if this is the case, you have the, the conjecture R of x. So maybe it's called a generalized uh, Riemann hypothesis. that says that if this function uh, vanishes at a certain complex number, and this complex number belonging to this critical stripe, then necessarily this number, this complex number, lives in this uh, vertical line. So it is necessarily the, in other words, all the zeros of this function, they are here. Okay, so zeros, okay, they are necessarily on this line. And uh, why is it called the generalized Riemann hypothesis? It's because it generalizes the Riemann, the classical Riemann hypothesis. So if you take, consider the following example, let's take for x just a, a point, so perf q, the simplest example that you can think of, which is of dimension, z, of dimension zero. Then of course that you have, a, that there exists a smooth proper model, a smooth proper model even on the entire uh, over z, which is spec of z, of course. And in this case, uh, when you take, there's only one weight, zero, so you look at the corresponding L function here. And this is just a product over all primes um, of this Acevel zeta function of the fiber at P. So this fiber, well, you know that is precisely the spec of FP. So it turns out that this is just a, a product over primes uh, of your one over one minus P minus S. Well, and that you know that you can rewrite in terms of a, a, a Drischler series as follows. So it's the classical uh, Riemann zeta function, which uh, over C, so in this case, uh, what's happening is that you have one, one half, and zero, and so you know that this function, it's well-defined and non-zero on this region. First of all, and uh, secondly, what we know about this function is, well, the conjecture m of x, in this case, it holds. There's no problem here. So this function actually extends uniquely to the entire complex plane. And there are no zeros on this critical stripe. And then the, the other conjecture, uh, this, well, this, uh, maybe it holds, maybe it doesn't, but what it's called, it's nothing but the classical Riemann hypothesis. Okay? So the simplest example is the Riemann hypothesis. And of course, this can be more general. You can think, uh, you can take here uh, a number field, and then you would also have a model which is just uh, given by the integers in your number field. Okay? And so in that case here, what you have, it's a product over uh, all primes. And then you need to, to do the product over those prime ideals above P. And it becomes one minus uh, the norm of that uh, prime ideal minus S. And so you can rewrite this in terms of this sum over all possible ideals uh, in this uh, 
ring of integers of 1 minus the norm of i s. So what you get in that case is the classical uh, Detkin zeta function, which is also known to uh, for this conjecture to hold, and this, con this conjecture is something called the extended uh, Riemann hypothesis in that case. Gonzalo, we have received a question. Yes. That's not a smooth model at the ramified primes. Yes. You can, you can do that also. Uh, what I'm talking about in terms of analytic continuation, the, um, uh, the, the bad primes don't count for the, the Serre's functor exactly, right? It's just a finite amount of information. But then you need to, to put them there to, to correct where the zeros will land, etc. If you don't have a good reduction, well, you still can do it, but in that case, you need to use cohomology, inertia, etc. Function, but, uh, no, it's not. I don't need it, and that's a key point here. Okay. I'm not using the the primes at infinity and making it complete. I don't need it, because when you are putting the primes at infinity, what you are doing with the gamma function is that this, when you when you when you do the extension, there are uh, zeros that appear here, and then you put the gamma function in such a way that the poles of the gamma function will kill these zeros, so that the only possible zeros will land here. But the way I'm phrasing it is that I'm just considering zeros in the critical stripe. So I don't actually need to complete it. So you don't need this big zero is completed at infinity. That's, the, that's why I'm... I don't need it, the way I phrase it. So my point is now is that uh, this still works. Uh, this still works in the non-commutative world. So now we can talk about the, the non-commutative uh, Riemann hypothesis. Um, so if you have uh, now a smooth uh, proper uh, DG category over the finite field. Um, so we saw in lecture one so we saw in the first lecture uh, that you can define this Asseveil zeta functions associated to them. Okay. And now if, if my A is over Q, so a smooth proper DG Q linear category, um, so this still works, still exists a, a smooth proper model, um, a smooth proper model which I write like this, uh, over, uh, so away from the bad primes. And I will assume, as above, that uh, we have good reduction. I will assume the existence of a smooth proper model um, uh, over my localization at pi, and this for every i between 1 and n. And in that case, uh, we can just use what we have done in the first lecture to define an L function. So in fact, as usual, it's not just one, there are two. So I have this L function uh, defined, so I do the product over all primes uh, different from these bad ones, and I do the Asseville zeta function uh, for this fiber here, and then I multiply by the, the remaining bad primes, I do this Asseville zeta function, pi, uh, and where this uh, is the fiber in the sense that it's um, doing the drive tensor product over FP uh, with PN. And similarly here, I'm doing the, this model and I'm changing it to FP over uh, the ZPI. 
and you can do uh, you can do of course the one version of it in a similar way for every prime so this it's this again and I do the product also I put in place the the, the bad primes okay and this it's this and now uh, what's the point here is that we have a a non-commutative counterpart of Serge's result. So the theorem is that, uh, so let's assume uh, that uh, let's assume that uh, the non-commutative well conjectures hold for the fibers hold for these fibers okay this for every p different from the the bad primes and this for i between one and n um, suppose let's assume that this holds then in that case, uh, this L function, uh, it converges um, on this uh, off plane whose real part is greater than one and it's moreover non-zero on this region. So I have C um, and I have uh, one half and one. And here I have this uh, region where my function this infinite product converges it's well defined of course i don't need this assumption right because this is just a finite amount of information and uh, similarly here in the one case the this function converges on this half plane uh, where it's greater than three over two and it's moreover different from zero so here, again, over C, so I have uh, one half, one and three over two. So it's in this region here uh, that my function, it's well-defined. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, of course, in this setting, we can also phrase we can also uh, conjecture uh, that we have um, meromorphic continuation. So we can conjecture that uh, um, first of both of these functions, both of these L functions, um, they admit a unique uh, meromorphic uh, continuation to C. Okay, and secondly, also that uh, these extensions, uh, respectively of L0, L1, so it has no poles uh, in this, uh, in the critical stripe. Um, going from uh, the real part between 0 and 1, respectively, when the real part is between 1 half and 3 over 2. So on this, uh, on this um, critical stripe, on this critical stripe, uh, I conjecture that there are no zeros there, there are no poles there. And then we can also phrase the, the conjecture of Riemann that says the following. So suppose, suppose that uh, this function uh, vanishes, respectively this function vanishes, 
with uh, a complex number in this critical stripe. Uh, in this critical stripe, respectively, here. Uh, then this implies that uh, this number it is necessarily living on this line, necessarily living on this vertical line. So the the zeros must be here. The zeros must be here. Okay. And so what is the the point of all this? Is the following. So I, I, I think I need to finish, so it's my very last blackboard. So let me just mention that uh, uh, the result is that if you take x uh, a smooth proper uh, scheme over q, okay, uh, for which the, this conjecture holds, then uh, you can look at the Riemann hypothesis for it, or you can look at the non-commutative version of the Riemann hypothesis for this. So this conjecture being uh, to hold will imply that uh, that this conjecture for perf of x will hold also. And so I can talk about this, and it turns out that these conjectures are equivalent as in the first lecture. Okay? So, uh, possible applications of this. Of course, we cannot use it as, uh, as I did today to uh, prove new cases of the Riemann hypothesis because there are not even cases of the Riemann hypothesis. The Riemann hypothesis over a point, it is the classical Riemann hypothesis. But you can use it to establish connections between two algebraic varieties saying that, in fact, the Riemann hypothesis for them which are very different algebraic varieties, are equivalent. So, for example, suppose that uh, one of them would be zero-dimensional and the other would be higher-dimensional. This would say that the Riemann hypothesis for the higher-dimensional is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis for the zero-dimensional, but for the zero-dimensional, it's just the Detkin zeta functions, so you can somehow reduce the complexity to Detkin zeta functions, which are very well studied. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Thank you, and sorry for going over time. Okay, uh, many thanks indeed for a wonderful mini course. Any questions or comments? Yes. So can you explain again more elaborately the last point you were making when you stopped after that? Can here. You, yeah, yeah. Can you explain it more? Maybe the so here, uh, so you see, uh, in the first lecture, we had this result for the conjectures, right? Exactly this result. I'm saying that the Riemann hypothesis, I could so put it in this package, where it can be extended to the non-commutative world in such a way that when you plug this kind of DG categories coming from schemes, you recover the original conjecture. So now I'm saying that if we play the game of today, of having two very different algebraic varieties, which geometrically are very different, but in terms of the motives are related, then I can relate the conjectures. So this I could relate the Riemann hypothesis for two different algebraic varieties. Suppose that one of those algebraic varieties is zero dimensional, for example, then this would say that the Riemann hypothesis for the other one, which could be higher dimensional, is equivalent to uh, a Riemann hypothesis for Detkin zeta functions. For example. Of course, this, this doesn't allow you to prove the Riemann hypothesis because the simplest case of a point is the classical Riemann hypothesis, but allows you to establish connection between Riemann hypothesis of very different algebraic varieties. So another question uh, from Remy. Is the reason that you are only considering um, L sub naught and L1 that you have Tate twists? Uh, the, 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 what's happening is that if you, uh, the, the L naught of the perf of the scheme, it's, it actually is going to identify 
over a product over all the even um, weights of the classical L function on X, but here uh, you need to uh, shift it by this. So you grab all the L functions for all even weights and you shift them to, to plus them precisely in that position there. That's the relation that you have. And you have a similar relation for one. And now it will be a product of odd. And now you, it's a shift uh, by one minus one over two. So this is the link between the non-commutative world and the commutative world. As usual, what you do is that you trivialize the Tate motive. So somehow you get lost of the, the individual pieces. You only keep track of the parity of that. Uh, thank you. Another question from anonymous attendee. Last talk you mentioned that in the non-commutative world, there is no Tate twist. You want to say that such an object does not exist in the non-commutative world or just that you did not find a good way to define it? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that it doesn't exist. It makes no... The Tate twist comes from what's happening with the projective line. Uh, and uh, the projective line uh, by additivity is just two points. Somehow it is not there. Any other questions or comments? If not, then grand merci for a wonderful lecture, uh, mini course, and uh, many thanks indeed. Thank you for having me. Thank you.